All right, so today is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bo Dai, a senior research scientist from Google Brain, uh, Brain to give a talk in our seminar. So uh, Bo obtained his PhD degree from George Tech. He's the recipient of the Best Paper Award of AI Stat 2016. His current research interest uh, uh, lies in developing principled machine learning and deep learning methods using tools for optimization uh, in particular on reinforced learning and the data-driven algorithm designs, as well as various uh, applications. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Dai to give a talk in our seminar. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, today maybe, uh, I will talk about reinforced learning uh, via optimization lens. Do you want to uh, share your screen? Oh, haven't? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it. Thanks. I uh, hope everyone can look, check it. Yeah, so uh, yeah, this is my title and uh, I'm both from Google Research Brain team. And uh, actually today we'll talk uh, several papers in this one hour long uh, section. And uh, uh, the, this series work is collaborated with Ophir uh, Inglam and Li Hong Chaba and Dale and many, many other friends. So let's see. Uh, let's uh, give an overview of today's talk. So let me set up so that's... Uh, yeah, so, sorry about that. So basically, uh, I will first introduce the preliminary of, of reinforcement learning. Uh, that's the first section. And later I will give a, a major core part of this talk. Basically, I will rewrite the reinforcement learning into uh, linear programming. And the third part actually is uh, the framework for solving this linear programming in, in the setting of all policy setting. Uh, you will learn what is all policy later. I will explain this terminology later, uh, which is DICE family, uh, stands for stationary distribution character estimation. And uh, today's talk, I will basically focus on the first and the third part, which is doing the all policy evaluation and uh, the confidential interval estimation with DICE. Uh, but if I time permitted, I will also talk about how we can use this DICE framework to solve other offline IO tasks, like uh, policy improvement and uh, imitation learning and so on and so forth. And finally, I will give a conclusion. Uh, okay, let's start the first part. Uh, so basically, first and second definitely is, first slide actually I will introduce about the Markov descent processes. That's the uh, basic model for reinforced learning. Uh, well, essentially, uh, MDP is then with, I denote M here is a, a tuple. It includes S as a set of states, A as the set of actions, T as the transition probabilities, R as the uh, immediate reward. Uh, because this talk, I will mainly co consider about the infinite Horizon MDP, so I will introduce a gamma. And uh, this gamma actually is introduced just for, to my, my understanding, it's just introduced for the valid, well definition, for, well defined for the uh, mathematical consistency. It can be, it, it is the scalar from zero to one, and you will see where we use it later. And, uh, and also uh, initial distribution mu zero. Uh, okay, I'm not sure whether I can actually introduce how we execute the MDP with this figure. If everyone knows it, I will save the time, but uh, if not, I will give more concrete explanation here. So, uh, sh should yeah, I think it's up to you. I think most people uh, are familiar with MDP since they have attended a few uh, seminar talks before. But if you want to give a brief introduction, that'd be uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, That's great. So I will cut this part because this will, I may focus on the later part. So let's see. Uh, this slide is most heavy notation slide in my talk. So basically, I want to make sure everyone knows the, make sure the notation we use later is well defined. So let's see what is it one by one. So policy, uh, I, I use pi as a policy, which is basically a conditional distribution, which is saying I give you a state S and the condition on the state, you will have a, a distribution over the action space. 
So that's what we call the policy. And uh, we also not denote the tau here as a trajectory, which is you play, uh, you execute this policy on your MDP, basically starting from S0 came from the initial distribution mu zero, and uh, and you put this S0 into the policy, and the sample from there you will have A0, and later you act. Uh, you execute the A0 on the MDP, and MDP will provide your reward based on this S0 and A0, that's R0. And the MDP itself will change to, basically the environment will change to another state, S1, and so on and so forth. You will collect a bunch of uh, uh, sequence of this kind of uh, observation. So that's what we call traje trajectory. And we later we define the Utah as the return of the, this trajectory, which is basically the geometry uh, discounted accumulated reward. And here, gamma is what I defined uh, in previous slides, which is the scalar uh, discounted factor. So that is defined to make sure this summation is always valid. It's always have a convergent, uh, convergent finite value. And now we can based on this definition, this U taught to define the value of policy, which is basically the central role, which plays the central role in our, this IL uh, community and this talk. We denote as V pi, which is expectation of this U taught. This expectation actually takes all the randomness into account, like the uh, probability of your policy and the randomness in the transition operator and also the randomness in the reward and so on so forth, everything into this expectation. So this is what we call the value of policy. And later we define the optimal policy, pi star, which, which, is, which will achieve this uh, maximum of v pi, that particular, that's arc max of v pi here. And uh, Actually, when I write this slide, I consider whether I should introduce this Q pi or not, because in today's talk, you will see a method, you will see a family of method which doesn't rely on this Q pi anymore. But uh, because the vanilla community is still working on this um, Q pi with many, many uh, existing classic algorithms, so I think we sh I should introduce this one so that I can make a comparison with the vanilla algorithm and uh, the proposed dice family. So what is QPi? QPi basically saying, uh, given you S and A, later you run this policy on MDP and you take the expectation condition on this S and A. That's what we define as QPi, I say. Uh, which we, we call it as state action value function. And uh, so far, so good. Any questions? Uh, good. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. So then let's go to the mm, famous uh, recursion function uh, equation called Bellman equation. What's that? That basically that is saying you can characterize this q pi by a recursion. The recursion actually is very, very simple. By the definition, the qsa could be written as this expectation. And we extract the first term, let's say uh, t equals to zero. So it becomes rsa. RSA. And uh, we keep the rest still in the expectation. And then we rewrite the expectation to one more step further. And based on definition of QPi, we, this part inside of the expansion is go back to Q, QPi. So that gives you this Q equals to R plus gamma expectation QPi. So this is very famous. This actually is the central uh, recursion in many, many existing classic IR algorithm. So, so far, so good. We, we, we are clear about the basic concept now. Okay, next I will introduce the uh, prop definition intuitively for many uh, IL problems. First one is the policy evaluation. Uh, as 
we see in previous slides, we define the what is the value of policy. So that's V pi. So policy evaluation actually just trying to say, okay, give me a policy. I want to estimate this V pi. And uh, based on what kind of sample you can use, it, it is characterized into two different cat categories. First one is called on policy estimation, which is saying you have the ability to literally execute this pi on your MDP so that you can collect a sample according to this execution of pi. So that's what we call on policy. And uh, you see, because you can collect a sample, so you can definitely use Mon uh, Monte Carlo estimation. So that is correct and straightforward. But uh, the better thing is you need to literally run this policy on, in the environment. So sometimes it is costly and uh, risky. Mm, so that's why we, we want to do some research on all policy estimation, which is saying, I already collected sample by executing another policy, which we usually refer as behavior policy. I did not have pi zero here. And uh, you cannot accept, you cannot execute your target policy, which is pi, the policy you literally want to estimate uh, so, but you still need to estimate the V pi there. This is definitely good because you don't need to execute pi in your real world environment. And uh, so that's safe and cheaper, but uh, because there's distribution shift, so you need to take extra, extra, uh, extra effort to, to re reduce such kind of files. So this is one problem in IL. Uh, okay, here I gave a more con concrete formulation of the opposite version. Basically, that is saying I gave you a data set, and data set is formed by a bunch of tuple, and the tuple itself is formed as S0, A0 from uh, initial diffusion and your target policy condition on this initial diffusion. Notice here, I still didn't run my environment with, uh, run my policy in the environment yet. And later, the S A reward S prime it came from D pi, and D pi actually is some distribution induced by by other behavior policy, which I I don't know who collected it, who collected it for me. I don't know that. And A prime here is condition S prime. You sample one more action from the policy. Still here, I didn't introduce this A into environment, which is saying. This still off policy. Uh, the goal here is I want to estimate this V pi based on this given data set uh, without knowing the transition operator and the reward function. And if we don't know the behavior policy, the formulation of behavior policy, who collect data for you, and we even don't know what form of behavior policy is, we call it behavior agnostic of policy evaluation. And uh, yeah, so far so good with I gave a uh, I give an introduction to one calculator, one core problem in our reinforcement, which is our policy evaluation. And next is policy improvement. It's another problem, which is saying, uh, okay, I don't want to get just the value of the policy. I want to find the optimum policy, which means I want to find the policy pi star, which achieves the maximum policy value. Still, it's calculated into two different uh, classes. One is called on policy, the other one is called off policy. Basically, we distinguish that this two kind of problem by what kind of data it can use, similar to the on policy evaluation. And the definitely on policy evaluation is one building block for on policy improvement because before your improvement, before you improve this policy, you should know what is the value of it so that you can based on that to get an improvement. This is policy improvement. And uh, the third uh, problem in IO is imitation learning. Uh, still, <laughs> it's characterized in the two categories, like uh, previous two problems. Why is on policy that is on policy? The target of this imitation learning, the task of this imitation learning is that I give you the expert data. Collect, uh, I give you the data collected from expert policy, and I want to learn the policy part so that it can match the given expert policy. Uh, 
roughly speaking, you can think this uh, imitation learning as a special case of the policy improvement because if I set the reward to be the difference between your current policy and the target policy, I mean, the expert yeah, policy. Uh, yeah. We got a question from audience. Yeah, sure. A question. So I have a question regarding the off policy learning. So uh -huh. the off policy, you assume that we have the historical data generated generated by behavior policy pi zero. Mm -hmm. So my question is, though, I I know that we can get access to all the historical data d, but can we not get some information about the behavior policy pi zero? Oh, that's a good question. Actually, this is go back to my slide here. So. That depends because uh, that's subtle. Because if I give you the behavior policy pi, the form of behavior policy, form of behavior policy pi zero, mm -hmm. uh, we know that one category of problem in uh, you have some kind of information. But uh, uh, in this talk, I will mainly focus on the setting where you don't know it. You can only get the sample from the pi okay. zero. You don't okay. know actual side information about the behavior policy. So in the case when you have no information about the behavior uh, policy, so this is a setting called the behavior agnostic OPE. Uh, it's only called behavior agnostic. OPE is particular for this. Okay, sorry, it's a behavior agnostic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So this talk you will mainly consider this kind of problem. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Good question. So that we can clarify what uh, this talk we care about. Uh. Okay, I think I finished major component of the introduction to the what is core problem in reinforced learning. Definitely, there's so many other kind of variants of this three different uh, problem. But uh, yeah, we got is... another question from the audience. So sure. Uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, you can unmute yourself and just speak. You you yeah you need to unmute. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question about the imitation learning setting. So in the imitation learning setting, um, uh, uh, how how do we measure the like how accurate we can recover this expert policy? Or is is it based on something re related to the rewards, or it 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 is it kind of independent about the reward? Uh, actually, this is a good question. You can definitely um. Let's first say there is the one criteria you can measure between the difference, uh, the difference between the your policy and the expert po expert policy because these two are the probability. So you can definitely use the uh, any x divergence to measure the difference between these two policies. Right. And so this is in in uh, independent to the reward function itself. Uh, and uh, you can define some measure which is not independent to the reward function. Let's say you can definitely say, okay, I want, I, I don't need to clone every uh, actions expert take. I just uh, compare whether these two achieve the same reward. That's also a, a valid pseudo map, I think. I see, thank you. So that's based on the different problem definition. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think you. Uh, but uh, I think actually I have a uh, yeah. clarification yeah. question. Sorry to interrupt. So here mm -hmm. you have pi d pi and pi zero. So I uh -huh. wonder is this pi d the same as pi zero, or they are can it can still uh, be different policies in this imitation learning setup? A good question. Actually, this is my <laughs> this is my typo. It should be pi d here. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, okay, no worries. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. And uh, then go back to the uh, the questions. I, I think major literature, when they refer to imitation learning, they always assume the reward. I mean, there's no reward. It's reward independent. But uh, I do remember I read some paper which is they, they define the imitation learning is I don't need to uh, copy every action from the expert, some kind of stuff. But actually, if you will see later, it's just the, the object function, which one you choose to optimize in this talk later. Thank you. Uh -huh. Are we clear about the uh, major core problem in IL? Yeah, that's good. Uh, let's, because this talk, I will mainly focus on uh, our policy evaluation. So as the 
as an example. So I will first show what's wrong with current existing uh, or possible evaluation. Um, so let's see, because we are talking about all policies. So the first idea that came out is that, okay, I can feed the transition operator T, and also I can feed the reward function. After that, you can execute your policy uh, on my fitted, fitted model. So that is called model-based. Uh, but the, the bad thing is, because sometimes environment is very, very difficult to model. So say like you want to uh, model the real world. And I don't, I think in some, this is really difficult. To, even you have a neural net, which is very flexible. So if that is the case, recall the, you need to execute the policy step by step. Sometimes even go to infinite. So if you do this kind of stuff, you are accurate, even you feel it very good. The one step error is very small. The is error accumulate. So this may kill you. The error may kill you. So you don't need to have a, you don't, you will not have a exactly uh, usable uh, policy evaluation method. So that's the bad thing for policy uh, model based. The other one is, the other two actually is uh, inverse propensity score and doubly robust estimator. This too can be understand that one character which is based on the important sampling to do to deal with the distribution shift because you have uh, data collected from another policy and you want to estimate your policy. So these two policies are different. So you will have a ratio appear in the estimator. This is good because it's eventually on on best, but uh, it varies can be go can go very high because you need to multiply. Okay, to the different, uh, uh, multiplicate this policy ratio many times because the horizon is very long. So it's not very good actually in practice. So another category uh, class of the uh, opposite evaluation is TD learning. That's based on uh, the well-known Bellman recursion I mentioned in previous slides. Basically you need to match, you need to learn the Q function by uh, the matching the left-hand side, the right-hand side of that my equation. That's what I wrote here. But there are some problem, actually. If you look into this problem, uh, at least two of them, actually, this two is, uh, one of them is you don't know by which marrow sample from here to make sure the left-hand side, right-hand side is equivalent. Because if you remember, let's go back to the, here. This is saying, this, this is from my question. This is saying you need to make it hold for every state and action. Remember, every state and action is pointwise. And go back to the object function. Oh, sorry. You don't know where your sample came from, following which distribution. So this is what we call distribution mismatch. And another one is purely optimization difficulty because you know, this is square function, and uh, inside of square function, you have another condition expectation. So, uh, you don't, you cannot use uh, stochastic gradient to optimize it. It will require, if you want to have a unbiased stochastic gradient, you need to two independent samples. So that's what we call double sampling bias, uh, which is invested in, in, in the IR literature for a long time. Based on this understanding of the drawback for existing method, we will this motivate us to propose this kind of new view to, to do the reinforcement learning, as we list later. We reformulate the IO problem as needle program. This is actually uh, the major message I want to convey in this talk. Okay, until now, I think I finished this first part. Let me go a little bit quicker to make sure every component is included. Okay, let's see, uh, I define another term, which is called a stationary state action occupancy. You may think this is very uh, tedious, but let me tell you what it is trying to say. This distribution is just saying, after you execute your policy on MDP, and uh, when this Markov ch chain goes to stationary, what is the station distribution of that? So this is a uh, definition. This is definition just to describe that kind of distribution. And why we want to define this distribution? Because with 
with this definition, we can rewrite the policy value as expectation just from this distribution to do integration over the reward function. Which means if you have this data distribution, you don't need to worry about the MDP and anything, uh, Markov Pro chain and so on and so forth. So just do sample from here and do the Markov, uh, sorry, Monte Carlo approximation, you will get the real pi. So every problem, then the problem reduced to how can I get this d pi or something related to d pi. Uh, so this is motivation for defy this stationary state action occupants. And similarly, we can simply derive a similar Bellman uh, recursion to calculate this d pi. The definition, uh, actually the derivation here is very, very simple as what I mentioned before to derive the Bellman equation. We just uh, extract one component and the list the rest of it and uh, based on the definition of d pi, you eventually ends up like a similar equation to Bellman equation. Uh, are we clear about this thing? I will not go step by step. Good. So if that everyone understands this part, I think the rest of it is very simple. We have this equation. Now we can rewrite our linear programming form for the policy value. How? Remember. So can you explain the p pi uh, substar a little bit? So what, what's the intuition of this? Uh, oh, it, uh, this is just a notation saying, mm -hmm. uh, let's say t is the transition operator. Mm -hmm. I gave you a state S prime, A prime, it will give, give me a uh, new S. Mm -hmm. And I just uh, augmented it with the pi so that it becomes the uh, condition distribution between, it give me S prime, A prime, S tilde, A tilde, it will give me S and A together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I times with D S tilde, A tilde, so that, uh, uh, and then integrate out of S tilde, A tilde, so the rest of it. That's the operator of p star pi. I see. Then back to the mark of uh, kernel, mark of yeah. chain. Yeah. yeah. So back to the the equation above this uh, equation mm -hmm. one. So from the second uh, equation, second uh, equation to the second line to the last line. So mm -hmm. how did you uh, derive that? Uh, I think what I do, what I'm doing here is quite a similar. Uh, okay, the green part here actually, so, uh, -huh. uh, is based on definition of d, right, and the rest of this part. Oh, okay, I see. Okay, uh -huh. that's a, yeah, yeah. So, right, right, right. Okay, okay. That, uh -huh. Thank Good. You. Mm -hmm. If this is the case, uh based on what we have discussed before, we can rewrite everything into this linear program. D, if it satisfies this condition, it will be my stationary distribution. So my reward function, uh, sorry, my policy value could be re rewrite as expectation D, uh, sorry, expectation of the reward with respect to this D, that's all. Clear? Good. So that's the linear program we want to solve eventually for the policy evaluation. Uh, but uh, although we don't need to deal with the infinite sample along the trajectory, the thing here is you have many constraints because this constraint is still for every state and action. It's not very good, but don't worry. That's why we introduced this dice family here. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh -huh. A question here. Uh, can you go back to the previous page? Sure. Yeah, just a sanity, sanity check. So in the in in this for this optimization problem, so you will entirely forget what the distribution d is, like in the previous page. You just regard the, the distribution d as a distribution you want to optimize. Yes. And uh, the the I can guess the number of. Uh, Learnable parameters is a, it's just a, the cardinality of s times the cardinality of a. Exactly, of, exactly. 
Okay. Uh, actually, this is quite good. Uh, this is great questions. Actually, the you can rewrite instead of rewrite as optimization, you can just say, okay, I want to solve this linear uh, linear equation, linear system, and then plug mm -hmm. it it back. Uh, okay. That's okay too. But uh, when we write this optimization, it's it's the same, right? And in another sense, you only have one feasible set. You only have one feasible solution to this uh, okay. constraint, and that's I why think, it's I want. I think perhaps you need another constraint saying that this target should be a distribution. For example, their summation should be exactly. Oh, I don't need that. I don't need that because uh, you see, this is a probability. Okay. And uh, this is another probability. And okay. this is gamma, yeah. So it contra itself tells you that, but good, good observation. And uh, actually, in practice, I do need some uh, calculate. I do need some condition to make sure my solution is not uh, invalid. Okay. Okay. And performance, so empirical performance. Will, so you you are saying yeah, if, if you add that each, kind of so you are saying if each entry in this distribution is positive and it is satisfied the first uh, equation equality constraint, it will automatically satisfy that their summation is exactly one. Yes, because this remember this is a, a Markov chain kernel. Okay. Okay, got it. Yeah. So there's no actual even you don't add, add the actual constraint. It's there's only one solution. So okay. It is a distribution. Okay, thanks. Okay, good. Uh, now we go to how we solve it. Yeah, we got another how? question from the audience. So, uh, Victor, do you want to speak? Victor, you can unmute yourself. I think uh, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, maybe maybe you can continue and uh, yeah, if Victor want to ask a question later, uh, he can ask later. Okay. 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 Uh, okay. Next section is about uh, how we solve this optimization in the of course, uh, offline setting of plus policy setting. As I mentioned, yeah, here, yeah, so many constraints possible potentially uh, goes to infinite many. How we can solve it actually. That's material too in optimization. We just solve the Lagrange formulation for this DLP. That's all. But even that, this D is still we do expectation. We don't have sample from there. But don't worry. We can do the we only we have sample from D pi. So we do a change of variable, which is saying I don't need to solve the original D anymore. I want to get a, I solve a ratio of it between your D and the DD. So that's what I define as top. And I plug it back into the object function. That's what I transfer from the first one to the second one. And also that's the reason why we call it that's because we are doing a stationary distribution character estimation, this part. And after I solve it, uh, your row path could be plug into the object function. So that's uh, row hat pi, which is, uh, the weighting of the samples, that's all. Simple, right? This is basically the dice backbone. Everything came from here. Uh, okay, so, so, so in this setting, you have to know what exactly D upper script D is? No, I don't need that. I just need a sample from D, D, D. Uh, But actually, you, you have to know what it is. You have to know the function in tau. But that's the function we optimize. Okay, so you would just uh, change the optimization over D to the optimization over tau. Yeah, that's from here okay. to here. Okay, okay, got it. Uh, but you, because eventually I don't need to, I don't care about the D, I only care about the D. Yeah, yeah, I know that. So, uh, yeah, uh, so far so good. Okay, let's go to the next slide. This is echo to the questions, uh, to the to the previous slides I mentioned about the drawback of existing method. We automatically uh, bridge a gap between d pi and dd because now we have a, uh, let's say here, 
we have this tau to rewrite the, the difference to handle the distribution shift. And uh, because my object function doesn't have the nested conditional expectation, so I don't need to care about the sam double sample issue. And also it's behavior agnostic. Check here. I only need to sample from this DD, as I mentioned. So, okay, that's good. We, we, we solve the previous existing, uh, previous, the issue in previous method. And uh, now I will, I will add some regularizer. The reason is when we first do this, direct augment this one, we map so many numerical issues. Uh, why? Because this is linear structure. I don't have curvature. So that's why I want to introduce some regularizer from optimization perspective. So, and also remember, uh, I think uh, Steve asked very good questions saying I need to ensure the distribution, the solution itself is distributed. Yes, I, in optimization, in practical optimization, I do need, I do require that. So that's why this uh, C is introduced. So this C is parameterized at all, so we can think in that way. I just make sure it's always bigger than zero. And then I introduce this lambda to ensure it is normalized in the sense that expectation over DD this C is equal to one. So this that's the uh, effect of tau here. Sorry, that's the effect of lambda here. Uh, and I, I introduced the regularizer of the uh, Q, Q, which is the due function, and also the regularizer to the uh, zeta here. And uh, you may think after I introduce this regularizer, you will have some files. But actually, uh, we characterize it uh in this paper saying we do a very comprehensive profiling saying under some cases yes sir okay okay under some cases yes with careless uh configuration of the regularizer you will introduce files but there do have some uh configuration setting you don't introduce extra bugs uh, if you're interested, you can go back to go to this paper to check it. And uh, the good thing for this one is actually I can use the existing literature, existing mature optimization technique to solve the reinforced learning problem, and with very strong theoretical guarantee. Uh, so far so good. So that's the basically how we use the opposite, so how we use the reinforce optimization technique to solve reinforce learning problem, specifically solving the all policy evaluation problem. Okay, good. Let's see, okay, here's the uh, uh, illustration of the performance of the dice family. Uh, this dual dice actually is a very special configuration for the regularizer. Uh, and we compare it to the TD, and uh, this IS is uh, inverse propensity score I mentioned before. And the dot line here actually is the true policy value. And uh, this is, this research, this experiment is conducted on the Richard, which is uh, environment in Mojico. Alpha stands for the difference between your behavior policy, pi zero and my target policy. As, as it's become larger and larger, this two become similar, more and more similar. Uh, so in all these three cases, you can see the our method is achieved the true value while the existing method doesn't give you a correct answer for that. And this is during the whole optimization. This is how many iterations or how many samples because this is stochastic. You uh, visit it during the optimization procedure. Okay, so that's the first part about how we use optimization to solve the reinforced learning. If you are clear with that, uh, here is very succinct description about uh, how we can use the same framework to solve the imitation learning and uh, solve the uh, policy optimization, or policy, of policy improvement problem. Uh, as, I, as you may re remember that uh, this D characterized the distribution of the policy. So I can 
in imitation learning because I'm I only care about the difference between this D and your DD, which came from expert. So this is actually define uh, F divergence between your D and D part, uh, sorry, DD. And uh, when you minimize this one, actually you find the D. And then you minimize pi, such that you push this D towards to this uh, DD. So that's the way you construct this imitation learning to uh, optimization. This is no longer a linear program, but it's still it's a convex optimization uh, in function space. Definitely, if you introduce some neural, neural network parameterization for pi and d, it will, it will no longer to the uh, of convex. But still, it is uh, computable, runnable. So um, why uh, for imitation learning, uh, you are doing minimization over the policy pi rather than maximize? So yeah, so can you explain it a little bit why it's a mean mean problem rather than a max mean problem? Okay, uh, let's say, recall the fact that there is only one solution satisfy this constraint. Mm -hmm. Okay, so actually, it mean D actually just trying to make sure your D satisfies this constraint. Uh, yeah, mean D, I think it's uh, easy to understand. Uh -huh. You also want yeah. to minimize the distance, uh, the KL divergence, for example, between the. Yeah, D because and imitation and learning. Mm -hmm. Itself is okay. The d function actually, sorry, the d distribution actually is a function of pi, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's set by this condition. So when you minimize this pi, it is just pushing this d to this d. Oh, d, okay. d. Okay, okay. So it is image the, 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 the x part we want. Okay, okay. So uh, can I this, understand the, it as uh, whenever so, so the no matter is minimization or maximization. Uh, the optimizing over pi and the optimizing over d, they should be simultaneously uh, mean or simultaneously as a max. Uh, I think that's probably dependent. Okay, okay. I, I cannot give a concrete answer yet, but based on these two things, I think what you observe is true. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the second one is with similar, same, same flavor. Uh, you, you, you do this. No matter, actually, this mean and max doesn't matter because there's only one solution. When you do this optimization, then just uh, make sure that D satisfies con condition. And uh, with that, you do maximize with respect to the uh, policy value. You will achieve the, uh, it will lead to the optimal value for you. Okay, same flavor for the construction of these two optimization for different tasks. Uh, this is a give a brief introduction how we construct optimization and later when you construct optimization follow the strategy we, we use for opposite evaluation with change it to like lounging and uh, so on and so forth okay good now next is the our recent paper published on uh, on Europe this year which is we want to have a confident interval estimation with this dice family. Why we want to confidence info? Actually, it's it is because the uncertainty itself is very important in reinforced learning. Why? In uh, exploration and exploitation trade-offs, where you 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 uh, you need to follow the optimistic <clears throat> principle, which is saying you you want to uh, optimize the upper bound of your policy value. And uh, in the off policy, in offline reinforcement learning, sometimes you take care of the safety, which is saying you want to maximize the worst case performance so that you need to take care of the lower bound of your estimator. So in both cases, we need to characterize the uncertainty. So that's why we, we think that the uncertainty is important in IR. So, okay, we have the <clears throat> dice family. So one idea came out is like, okay, I, I can do the bootstrap. Uh, the, the procedure is like this. You, you, you have the data set D and then you construct the DI by resample from the data set. And you conduct the uh, dice algorithm to only on this DI. And you repeat this procedure many times. You will have a bunch of estimator and forms as a, a population. And you can as, calculate the variance based on this uh, set of estimators. Uh, yeah, it's good in some sense because the stati statistic property of this one is very good, but uh, you know, the computation procedure is super expensive. Uh, 
Then the question says, can we reduce the computation cost? The answer is yes, that's what we call the quantize here. Uh, this is time I will give a brief idea how we derive this one. Uh, okay, let's go back to see this in uh, bootstrap. Uh, what's the difference between different estimators? If you look into the procedure, actually the resampling procedure is like I conduct the different weights to different uh, sample in your D. So uh, this gives us intuition and that's why we have this mean and max. This is uh, optimize the weights for each sample uh, so that I can eventually have a uh, uh, lower bound, upper bound for the estimator. Maybe notation here is a little bit weird uh, to this L. Actually, it's my Lagrange, if you remember previous notation. So this minimum W is uh, in in this re regime, so that it's not far away from uniform, but uh, it still do some uh, perturbation to the, each sample. And you do this, this minimum, actually, it's saying, I want to find the which such that my estimator will achieve a lower bound. Sim similarly, it happens to max, which is a, I perturb the sample so that it will form the upper bound for my estimator. I will clear about intuition how I construct this uh, lower and upper bound. Okay, good. So this is saying, okay, instead of I do a lot of uh, first a sample and then calculate, uh, and then run the dice algorithm on each subsample and then do statistical calculation. I can use optimization directly to solve the lower and upper bound. Okay, and uh, after I construct that, I think, okay, so optimization may be com so complicated because I need to solve this min max min and max min max, but don't worry. Uh, <laughs> in fact, we have the closed form for this uh, WL corresponding to this W, this optimal solution to this W, and the WU to this, to optimal solution to this maximum over W. And I can plug this back into the optimization, it still become a min max problem. So roughly speaking, the computation cost is not far away. Uh, and also this, there's some connection to SIVA because the time limit, I don't, I will not expand this section, this, this item. Okay, actually, the computation procedure or estimatory construction is not that difficult, but difficult part actually came from how we prove it is a, a, a phenotopic confidence inter interval and how we form the finite sample character for, for the um, LN and UN. And uh, actually, we, 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 we prove that after you have this LN, UN by the quantized estimator, it is uh, it is for uh, asymptotically it is one minus alpha confidence interval, and also we provide the finite sample character. And I, I should emphasize that this part one over n it is not uh, one over square root n, so that the character it is in the faster rate. Uh, okay, here's the theoretical guarantee for this quantize. And now it's time to show the empirical performance for that uh, estimator. Mm, okay, this is still to to environment. Uh, we compare the conflict for in two criteria by two criteria. Why is the whether it is uh what's the coverage of it? Whether it's satisfy my uh, requirement? Whether it is literally is one minus alpha confident interval. Uh, the that one is how large is it? Because if I say the computation is super large, and uh, there's meaningless because every, everyone has almost the same cover, uh, confident interval, same upper and lower bound, so it's useless. So let's see the, the performance of our method. Let's just take one picture here. Uh, this is expected coverage. Uh, this alpha equal to 0 0.6 to 0.95. So as the, the closer to this dot line, the better it is. We compare to the bootstrap algorithm and the Bernstein student T uh, confidence interval and our method achieved better coverage, which means uh, in 
for example, in this specific setting, which means uh, in 95%, the true value li lies in my estimator regime. And this is the wide wideness of log wideness of it. So the, the tighter the it is, the smaller it is. So our algorithm beats the other existing method. So the rest of them are similar. And uh, okay, I think I finished major component of the talk. Uh, finally, is some conclusion. Before we go there, any questions about this uh, component interval estimation part? Yeah, go ahead, please. Hello? Yeah, please uh, unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, can, can you just turn to our previous slides about uh, uh, some topic results for the uh, coin dice? Yeah, yeah. Here. Uh, so I'm just wondering that here it says that when n tends to the infinity and the probability for the row pi belongs to this interval can be uh, characterized by this uh, k-square uh, distribution, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, can, can you give some intuition about why the distribution is some kind of k-square? Is, is, uh -huh. is that true that, uh, is that true that uh, because the the distribution for the row pi is can be regarded as a summation of the a list of square square and uh, random variable. Is that true? Uh, intuition for is quite square because I use the uh, functional delta method. So it's chi square is quite standard if you use that. Essentially, it is like a Taylor expansion in functional space of your estimator. And you control the uh, first term and the linear term. The rest of it is a uh, square term. And uh, with the central limit theorem itself goes to, if some variable itself goes to a uh, Gaussian and the quadratic form for this term goes to chi-square. So that's why you have chi-square here. Okay, got it, thanks. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, any other questions? Uh, okay, let's go to the conclusion model. Actually, uh, let's recap what we have done in, in this whole theory, series of the uh, research lab. We Core idea is we recast the optimize the reinforced learning into some optimization problem, and then we can use uh, either Lagrangian or any other kind of method to solve it. And uh, yeah, second is with this kind of philosophy, we can use the tenderness dice family for for example pulse optimization and imitation learning. And later we 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 establish how we can do the behavior agnostic composite into estimation. And this is major component of the talk. And uh, for the future work, actually, we we almost finish it. Is the uh, because we have the confidence interval, you have the upper bound, and uh, roughly speaking, you have almost the same property with the. If you're familiar with UCB, you can do a comparison between these two. It's quite similar. So you will have the uh, relative regret bound. When you access, when you optimize this upper bound with this corners, uh, it's quite similar to UCB. That's what I can see. Uh, later, something I haven't solved yet. Remember, all this thing relies on a uh, min max problem. If you don't go through neural network or other kind of complicated, complicated transition, it is convex. And concave, so we're we're fine, we're safe. But if we go to that regime, uh, uh, to be honest, I don't see any stable algorithm yet to solve it. So, in general, I I, I know it's NP hard, so I don't I don't expect it. We have uh, general optimization can solve this dice, but uh, you know in dice we have very special structure. Uh, I was thinking whether we can utilize the structure to construct some better algorithm to solve it. That's uh, always a problem hanging. I haven't 
so it yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's all. And uh, the the references listed here, uh, the two dice actually is the first dice we proposed, and uh, coin dice is later what we discuss about uh, uh, how we can construct the confidence interval with dice jump. And uh, this paper is a summarization of uh, a, com a comprehensive summarization of the thing I talk I discussed today. And uh, this one is uh, the way we use it for the policy, policy improvement. And uh, yeah, this one is uh, we, the way the policy regular, regular is like launching for policy evaluation and so on. So forth. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Yeah, that's a great talk. Thank you. Uh, so I, let's take uh, uh, more questions uh, from audience. Yeah, please raise your hand and I will unmute you and let you ask questions. Okay, so first of all, maybe I can, uh, let me ask you one question. So can you go back to the uh, derivation of the uh, Lagrangian, so the first uh, uh, Lagrangian form you uh, derive? Yeah. yeah, right. So I, I wonder how did you uh, come up with this uh, uh, Lagrangian of the linear programming in previous slides? So I, I didn't quite, uh, for the okay, I do some uh, algebraic manipulation here. Let's say, mm. uh, for example, I multiply when I move the constraint to the Lagrangian. Yes, I should take a minimal over uh, my dual variable, which I stands for Q. Oh, so Q function is your dual variable. Okay, yes, yeah, Q actually is my dual variable. Okay, so if that is the case, you will see. Uh, the this term, this mm -hmm. term actually corresponding to this one times q. Right, right. And the d minus gamma p pi d actually stands for here. Right. It's but uh, where's the d? Oh, so you okay? You, I see. Oh, okay. So you basically you uh q is your uh, Lagrangian multiply and uh, uh the inner product between d and q is. Uh, you just write it as an expectation. Yeah, 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 exactly. Actually, okay. I didn't mention, actually this Q, when you saw this Q, actually it's, this Q function is exactly the Q pi function. Uh, let me see, I, I have something here. Mm -hmm. This is primal. Uh, okay, here do and primal actually switched. You, you can think this is the object function I mentioned in the mm -hmm. talk, okay? Mm -hmm. I treat it as, if I treat it as do, the primal is looks like this. Oh, okay. And uh, the thing is, although here is big or equal to, but mm -hmm. uh, your object function is always uh, ch uh, chasing for the smallest one. Mm -hmm. So it push this Q to equal to right hand side. I see, okay. So you first have the dual problem, you write down the, the grounding and then you just directly go with the grounding. You didn't derive the primal, right? Although you have this primal view relation. Yeah, I, although I, I have it in the later uh, slides, I didn't mention the relation between here because uh, I, will, I will think if I do this formulation, maybe there will be some confusion to us. But okay. anyway, yeah. I yeah. see, I see. Okay, cool. Mm. So that's the relationship between the D formulation, I mean, D formulation mm -hmm. with the Q formulation. And the Q formulation actually corresponding to the uh, well known Bellman equation. Right. Except that uh, this is an inequality conjugate. Uh, yes, except it's inequality, but don't worry, the minimal part will push it to equivalent. At the bottom, okay, I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, my second question is uh, like uh, following up the first question can you go to uh, the, the grounding form? So, Right, so uh, now I understand how you derive this uh, the grounding. And in the next equation, I remember you somehow lift, uh, right. So how did you uh, convert the maximization 
over D Tudor maximizing over tau. I remember this audience as a, as a quite yeah, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Let's say uh, this is let's use summation here. Okay, this mm -hmm. is summation over D essay and the rest of this part. Right. Okay. So yeah. I I do important sampling actually. Oh. I okay. I see. Pi. So this tau will be this thing. Okay. And okay. If I have a good assumption saying this is bounded. Okay, I can cancel this two term. Mm -hmm. So it is, oh, in another sense, if the D is induced by this D pi, so you don't mm -hmm. worry about the rest of stuff. Right, it is right. equivalent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, oh, oh, right, yeah, that's true, that's true. And can I go to the next slide? I remember you introduced the different uh, uh, notions no, right. of alpha, right, and the lambda. So what are these, in, I know uh, by e, uh, introducing these additional optimizing variables, it will just make it more general or more relaxed, but uh, uh, what, what, what's the motivation or intuition to add? Uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. actually you raise a very good question. In mm -hmm. this paper, we discussed this as a, a robust optimization uh, justification, but let me give you intuition here. Okay. Uh, as the the uh, I think Fan right mm -hmm. Fan D Fan right Fan mentioned the D should be distribution mm -hmm. so that my uh, this is parameter the tau so that my parent tau which is the ratio should mm -hmm. be bigger or equal to mm -hmm. right so that's why I have this bigger or equal to construct mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I see and uh, and also it is a distribution so that means my expectation over D, over DD with tau should be equal to what? Let's see this one. My expectation over tau, over DD, this part should be equal to one, right? So actually that's how lambda comes out. If you write that as a construct and do the same log launching, you will end up this lambda here and lambda here. I see. Okay. I see. And yeah. uh, then the uh, alpha Q, this is regularized for alpha. Fy okay. is a compact function. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens here. This is regularized to my Q, uh, to my Z dot. And, okay. mm -hmm. and the interesting, Thing here actually, you can also add some uh, alpha r to r. For example, you set alpha r go to zero, you still can achieve a solution zeta not changed. The reason is because there is only one solution in your feasible set. You don't worry about the object function. So here, this zeta variable, this uh, dual variable is proportional to the tau variable in your previous equation. No, no, actually, it, uh, if you solve it, uh, solve it, it is equivalent. Is it equal or just proportional? Uh, it is equal. Equal, okay, I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, let's say whether we have more questions from the audience. Uh -huh. Yeah, hi, uh, maybe, maybe I have some questions about the optimization algorithms you choose to uh, optimize this kind of uh, constraint version of, the, of E. So uh, I'm just wondering, so, uh, in my understanding, I, I guess this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, formulation can be can, can be regarded as some kind of special important important sampling, right? And uh, I'm not sure yeah, if, if that okay. yeah, I'm not sure that if we can apply some um, popular methods in the optimization with the important sampling, such as the variance reduction, into this uh, into the optimize, into optimizing this kind of formulation to achieve some. Maybe it's a bound or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, it has the variance reduction automatically. Why? Look at it. I think it's more clear here. Look at here. It's minus Q. You can always treat this part as a, a, a variance reduction term. Oh, so here this Q. Uh, but here, actually, uh, you, you try to uh, minimize uh, over both D and Q. So this, this Q itself can automatically be regarded as some baseline uh, as, yeah. as you use the in the variance reduction. Exactly. exactly. Okay, okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. um, 
But uh, let me tell you something interesting. Uh, but uh, actually, this is related to something called a W robust. We introduce some uh, baseline to the marginal marginalized important sampling, and it's a behavior like in baseline. So the idea is, seems like related to W W robust. But actually, in this paper, actually we conduct comprehensive study. And uh, shows that the doubly robust condition is very difficult to hold. Why? Because doubly robust saying you need to make sure at least one of the uh, estimator is unbiased. But if you parameterize both, parameterize this, uh, let's still go to the original. If you parameterize this one and you parameterize this one, uh, that is, there's no hope. And if that something is broken, your, your, this term, although it looks like a, a doubly robust, actually you accumulate a uh, approximate error and the performance of this one is even worse than this, this formation. So that is because that you, you want to jointly, I mean, jointly optimize over the tau and q. So uh, it, I think it's because not just joint, uh, joint optimize, it's because you introduce the parameterization to both tau and q. And remember in W plus, actually it requires at least one of them is uh, unbiased. Okay, okay. Right. So you break this one, W robust actually e panel, penalizes it. It's even worse because it's no longer W robust. You, yeah, so sad. Yes, makes sense to me. Yeah, thank you. Great. So any other questions from the audience? Okay, so if there's no questions, let's thank our speaker again. So that's a great talk. Thank you. And also thank you for attending today's seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your attention.